Hello everybody, I'm back in Boston and uh, as you can see I'm here to give you another update. Uh, my name is Martin, I'm an Inkscape developer and I develop features and fixes for everyday uh, users and I tell you about some of the work that I've been up to and um, first of all, as always, I want to give a big shout out and a big thank you to all of my sponsors. Basically the way this works is I raise money directly from users like yourself um, in order to spend time fixing and maintaining and improving Inkscape for the future. Um, if you are interested in making Inkscape better, then there are basically a few things that you can do. First of all, you can sponsor me on Patreon, you can sponsor me on LibrePay, um, you can share these videos, and you can actually get involved by testing things. Uh, and a big thank you to everybody that does those things and basically is involved in this project. Okay, so uh, now that I'm back, um, I wanted to talk about uh, the color stuff that I've been up to and um, as you probably know when I first started doing the color stuff back back in November now it's been quite some time uh, I put the code into the git repository the public so that other programmers could review the stuff that I was actively working on um, I got a few reviews at the beginning um, but then as time went on uh, especially over the Christmas pe period, I basically got no more reviews. And this kind of worried me because this is a pretty big uh, refactoring and change to Inkscape's, like how colors work and function. And so, unfortunately, I, I, I needed to continue to work on this project, so I just continued on. Uh, and that is until last week when I started getting some reviews. And the reviews that I got were kind of mixed. Um, some programmers in the Inkscape project feel like the way in which I've done things is not exactly correct. And uh, after talking with some of the programmers uh, who are not inside of Inkscape about the review that I got, um, I think this is mostly to do with the fact that the um, there's not a great explanation about what it is I'm doing and why have I decided to spend this amount of time doing it. So uh, what I'm going to do is uh, on Sunday, there's a developer me meeting and I've been invited to basically answer qu questions. And I've decided to, in instead of just answering qu questions, ask you do a presentation. And I'm going to uh, phrase it in terms of a defense of the work and the designs that I've cho chosen and try to explain why it is that I've made certain decisions. In order to help me, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to do this uh, presentation for you guys. You're going to help me practice my presentation and uh, hopefully it'll be interesting and useful to you but also you should be um, forewarned that this is probably going to skew more technical so if you are here for the designing and tips and tricks and stuff that some sometimes leak out when I talk about stuff this might not be the video for you but if you are interested in just like what is inside of this work and the more nitty-gritty of like you know, how it's all put together, uh, stick around. You, you may find it interesting. Um, okay, so I think I'm going to need to change camera positions, though, uh, to get you guys into a better position. Let's see. Nope. Right, and there we go. Okay, so let's see. So first of all, this color refactoring work is um, trying to fix a problem. So let's talk about what those problems are. In Inkscape, in our color code, we have a lot of duplication. This is basically where um, different prom programmers over many years have tried to solve very similar problems, and they've coded you know, ways in which they have um, parsed colors or printed colors or interpreted them or converted them. And you know, it's not terrible. There's, there's reuse in certain ways. In, in for instance, uh, hue, saturation, and value stuff tends to be consistent. Um, but there is a lot of duplication. Uh, the second part is that the current color APIs that we use are entirely unobvious. Um, what you want from a, a, a system is sort of consistency and good design, surprisingly. like Most programmers might not think of design as being important, but actually design is a critical component if you are um, making code that other people will have to read. And this is very much uh, the thing that Inkscape has to drive towards because Inkscape is not a one-man project. It's a, it's a many-person uh, project and we need to make sure that the code that we write is understandable by the most amount of people possible. Um, the color code is also unfocused. 
Uh, this is partially due to the fact that there's, as I said, hundreds of programmers that have worked on Inkscape over the years, um, but it's also because um, it, it, it assumes a lot of things about red, green, and blue, um, and where people have needed non-red, green, and blue pro um, functionality, they've kind of just ad hoc put it together where, where possible. Um, parts where we've used ICC pro profiles or we've done CMYK stuff has, has been tacked on after the fact. So there's a, there's not a lot of focus on sort of making a, a holistic system. And the fourth and then probably most critical is none of it is tested. Like, like absolutely none of it. Uh, by, by tested, I mean unit tested, right? So no, none of these functions actually have tests which cover the actual, just the core piece of fun functionality. Okay, so now we've stated the problems. Um, the reason why these are problems now is because we want to improve and increase the capabilities of Inkscape's color support. And if we try to build on the current duplicative, unobvious, uh, unfocused and untested code, um, the maintainability or the, the maintenance cost of Inkscape would increase considerably, I think. Um, and so we do refactoring in order to solve some of the underlying problems keeping the uh, project looking the exact same to the, the, the average user, uh, but just uh, improving the maintainability and uh, reducing the cost of further ma maintenance down the line, especially if you're going to add new things. Okay, so when I talk about making this color thing a design, I'm serious. I have a design brief about what I'm trying to achieve. Okay, the first thing is, is to keep the existing functionality. Uh, we want to, we don't want to actually introduce a, a load of cha changes about how Inkscape functions. So the idea is to maintain as much as possible um, Inkscape's existing fun functionality, even if that means um, pushing things towards red, green, blues. Uh, we'll try and improve things going for forwards, but each of those decisions about changes has to be done properly and in, in its own scope, I think. The second is uh, we want to centralize the code. The color code needs to be in its own place. Uh, where all the programmers can see, yes, that's color code, it belongs there. Um, the third is is to modularize the API. This is something a lot of pro pro programmers don't do a lot of uh, when it comes to API design. But the idea is, is that you want a piece of code which is um, in internally consistent and has a public interface and um, can integrate with other things in a componentized way. So like this one thing, color, interacts with this other one thing, display, that interacts with this one other thing document, which interacts with this one other thing XML, for example. Um, the reason why you want to do this as a design is because um, programmers are not are not really geniuses. They just have a very particular way of thinking about problems, um, and that means you still need to have heuristics, right? You still need to be able to make programmers understand and learn your your particular ways of coding your API as fast as possible. The best way to do, do that is to, just to make all of the uh, implementation details, all of the things that are inside that the programmer doesn't really need to care about, not interesting to them, right? So you need to make a modularized, easy to use, simplified interface on the outside. And you can make decisions about how to implement that on the inside that includes things like making it faster or use less RAM, etc. Um, the fourth thing, which I think should be obvious, is aggressively writing tests. So in this design, the idea is to write uh, unitized tests for each of the pieces of fun functionality so that we can actually say, yes, this works as the designed, and we expect that going for forwards, we won't have issues with this unless there's unintended consequences, in which then you have to write more tests to cover that. The fifth thing is actually to expand functionality. We do want to actually prove that it's possible to build upon what we have, uh, and especially when it comes to making things consistent. Uh, when you build consistency into some programming designs, you actually end up covering uh, functionality that was uh, not in, not included before, and that's because it's just it just happens to have been corner cases and things that. Uh, didn't seem important to the original programmers, but as you make things more consistent, this, this functionality tends to be included. Uh, but in this particular case, I've actually expanded the functionality to CSS color modules, being able to uh, represent and parse uh, many, many, many more kinds of uh, web colors as well, as well as uh, various bits of fun functionality to do with CMS uh, and CMYK. 
Okay, so that's the design brief. Now, can I meet that brief? This is how the color refactoring branch is structured. There is a folder called colors, and it contains basically these items. There is a CMS uh, module that its entire job is to basically cover all of the LCMS2 interactions. There's a color pro pro profile and tracking module that is to actually interact with the XML uh, color pro profile that's actually embedded in SVG files and be able to extract those and use them. There is the parsing and printing of colors, which is a uh, basically a functionalized way of, of um, turning uh, values into strings and back again. Um, there's a color conversions section called spaces that handle all of the, not only um, ICC pro profile spaces, but also all of the uh, internal conversions between HSL, HSV, uh, RGB, CMYK, etc. Um, there is the color objects themselves, which is the, the central public um, API object. This is like the main interaction that other pro programmers will have with this. There are utility functions, which are essentially pieces of functionality uh, that will be heavily used within the code base or are so specific to colors and, uh, and, and don't really have a good place in the code base, but should be here, um, but don't actually fit in with the color API itself. And then the last, which I dis I discovered uh, pretty recently, I would say, is the signal designs. Um, and this happened because there was a whole bunch of code that was duplicating the way colors uh, and color changes in objects were being distributed th through the code. The patterns were the same, they were just duplicated. And through this, uh, we will be able to um, basically remove that duplication and uh, test it pro pro properly. Okay, so what is not in this code? Um, we do not have GDK and GTK widget stuff, uh, nothing to, to do with writing colors um, in widget land. Uh, there are no Cairo utilities here. Uh, that's the actual um, application branch, which is the next one, except for the exception of uh, what we do with, with Cairo, C uh, Cairo bytes when it comes to converting them for previewing CMS work. So when you're doing a print preview, um, but I'll get to the CMS stuff in a minute. Uh, there's no style or CSS management work, and the, it's not the refactoring branch itself. So a lot of the work uh, to do with actually plugging all of this, this new module into Inkscape itself is not included in this module. Uh, that comes in the, uh, the ap application branch, which has its own review. Okay, so let's start with some of the pieces that we have here. Um, let's start with the CMS module. It's basically three parts. It's the system, the profile, and the transformations. The system is all about finding ICC pro pro profiles on your computer, finding the directories that they, they might exist in, and listing them and being able to find them by your ID and stuff, stuff like that. The profile is the actual loading of that ICC data off the disk, um, telling you things about it, like its name, its ID, uh, what kinds of things it supports, etc. Uh, and the transformation is a... Uh, it, it basically covers the LCMS2 um, fun functionality, but it also consists of researched code where I've basically gone through GitHub code research searches and a bunch of other things to figure out what other programmers have done when it comes to converting uh, byte stacks and things into other color, uh, into uh, using ICC pro pro profiles to convert their colors and find the best ways of doing it. Um, and so I basically codified those into, into the transformation API so that anybody who uses ICC pro profiles and is blitting things to a Kairos sur surface or changing a PIX map or uh, just converting one of our color objects, all of those things are consistently done in a way that's understandable. Um, the CMS mod module, is, its intention is that it will cover everything to do with interacting with the LCMS2 library. If the LCMS2 is ever included anywhere else in Inkscape, that's an error. Um, my intention is, is that this module should cover that, and if there is some other fun functionality in the future that needs to be added, it should be added here. Color pro profiles. Now, in an SVG file, um, in the XML, in, in the defs, you can actually have an ICC profile. You, it can be referenced as a bunch of bytes, or it can be an actual uh, file location on your disk. The idea here is that your SVG document can say, um, you know, the colors that I'm about to use are based in this ICC pro profile. Um, 
the LCMS2 stuff that used to be in the in the SP object, this is basically uh, the internal Inkscape representation of the of the XML node. Um, that was all crammed into that SP, SP object. It's been gutted and removed. The SP object is now a very, very simple uh, SP object that interacts with both the CMS module and the spaces module. Um, this is much, much more uh, straightforward to understand. Uh, and then there's a tracker object that basically keeps track of all of the color profile objects that get added to the document uh, or re removed as the case may be and is able to sort of manage uh, the colors for the document better. Okay, uh, conversions. So the idea here, is, and this is probably one of the most, um, apart from the color API itself, I think, this is probably gonna be one of the most confusing parts of the design because it depends upon understanding the design principle that I'm going for here. What we want is, is a, a color space definition, right? It's an object that says, this color is in red, green, blue. Okay, this color is in CMYK. Okay, this color is CMYK and it uses this ICC pro profile. Okay. So the way I've tried to organize this is that it, um, at the root of each of these spaces is an ICC profile. And then optionally, you may have a, a set of, of code that does conversions um, into and out of the numerical space. So for example, most of Inkscape's um, existing color spaces are actually sRGB. So the ICC profile, the root ICC profile they use is sRGB. And then there is some functions that convert into sRGB and out of sRGB as necessary, right? And so for instance, if you're um, HSL, Hue Saturation and Lightness, there'll be a function that converts from HSL to sRGB, and there'll be a, a, a function that converts from um, um, S where did I say HSL? HSL to, to sRGB. And then the reason why it's constructed in this way is so that if you have an ICC pro profile color and you want it in HSL, you don't have to think about whether it's an ICC profile or not. All you do is call one conversion fun function and the ICC profile that it's in is completely transparent, right? And whether the color is a native sRGB or the values are represented in something else, that is also transparent. The idea is, is that somebody who is using this color code from the outside never ever has to think about how the conversion happens or whether it's one particular system or a different kind of system or anything. Um, what we should end up with is basically each of the um, color spaces should inherit from their ICC profile parent that basically specifies, hey, this is the ICC profile I really am, and also include then a bunch of virtual fun functions which specify how to convert into and out of that ICC pro profile. For an ICC profile that is embedded in the SVG file, this is just uh, these are just blank functions. The, the, the functions are, are empty, um, but the ICC profile itself is still there. So you can essentially convert from ICC profile to sRGB or whatever, right? For um, conversions like HSL, there's a function there that converts into sRGB and out. For some of the other more complicated ones, uh, there is actually a chain of conversions that has to happen. I've tried to make these static and it's not entirely um, clear about like how the inheritance should work, but essentially it doesn't really matter how many how many functions that has to be run on the val values in order to get back to sRGB. The point is, is that the functions just have to make sure that the values can get back to, uh, to the ICC pro pro profiles space and back again. And if that's possible, then it really doesn't matter how they're organized in terms of inheritance. Um, we just need to make sure that the um, the actual fundamentals about what you're trying to achieve in terms of um, the, 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 the transparency of conversions of colors is, is maintained, right? Whether we end up with just a whole bunch of static fun functions or whether we end up with, uh, you know, a whole bunch of inherited stuff, it doesn't matter. The, the system wants to be as 
self-consistent and as testable, unit testable as possible, while also meaning that users, by users I mean other programmers who deal with colors, never have to think about whether something is an ICC profile or not. Okay. Color objects. This is another contentious point, right? Uh, some other programmers want to design things in terms of just a, basically a, a, an empty shell with just a bunch of numbers in it and then a whole bunch of functions that you can do stuff to the numbers. Um, I don't like that. Uh, it's not a good design. And I, I don't think it's a good design because we need a, a consistent um, API uh, that other developers can use. And the best way to do, do that is to take advantage of object-oriented programming to encapsulate what it is about the data that we're trying to represent, its consistency, and some of the, the functions and conversions that we can run on it. So a color object is essentially um, a bunch of numbers plus a color space. Uh, so it's a very small memory footprint, and it should be pretty self-explanatory in terms of the, the, the internals, that if you want to do a conversion from this color space to another color space, um, you, you just essentially uh, move the numbers around and then change the space, right? That's all you have to really do. Because the color space, the, the thing that we were just ta talking about in the previous entry, um, should be able to do all of the actual functioning work on the num numbers. But of course, from the outside, from a programmer's perspective who is just using colors, all they have to do is say, hey, this color I've just been passed in from, doesn't matter where, doesn't matter what color space it is, doesn't matter that it's an ICC profile or anything, they just say, hey, can I have this in red, green, blue, please? And this system will say, here you go. It doesn't matter what it is, they can just say, hey, can I have this in this in this ICC pro pro profile, please? And it will say, here you go, here, 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 here it is. The API needs to be as, as transparent as possible about uh, the the conversions, I you can say, okay, is this thing in red, green, blue, or not? That's for. But as far as like other programmers are concerned about like how they use colors, they just need to be able to pass these objects around, uh, which means we need to have to be able to copy them where necessary. Uh, we need to be able to compare them to see if they they're equal or not. Um, we need to be able to use them uh, fairly in other func functions, for instance, in utilities. Um, and also we need to be able to do things to them and sort of trying to decide which things are uh, API and which things are utilities. That might be a discussion worth having. Um, but a lot of the API is sort of trying to say, hey, these are all of the things that uh, a color object is concerned with. And um, hopefully with the better documentation that we can have, uh, we can tell, we can educate other programmers in sort of like the scope of the of the functionality that is available to them and maybe in the future they can add things in a consistent way into this API as well. Okay, so utilities. This is what I was talk talk talking about in terms of functions. These are just usually more advanced things that you can do to colors. Um, there is a bunch of fun functions to do with HSL, a bunch of functions to do with lightness and deciding whether some, so something is more or less gray. Uh, usually these are functions that were just spread out all over the code code base and they've been gradually brought into a single place. Um, the decision about whether something should be brought in or not was generally, uh, was it separable from um, its original location and was it duplicated? I, did it, was, it, was it happening more than one time in the code base? If both of those things were true, then it was very, very likely I would bring it into this ut utility, if not actually put it in the API for colors. For example, the drag and drop and the XML colors. Um, there's a specification for basically being able to drag and drop colors around and being able to paste them and stuff, um, especially when you're talking about ICC profiles or a CMYK profile or whatever. You do need a more advanced system than just a hash and a bunch of hex codes. And that's what all of that code was supposed to do. I cleaned it up, I, I, I've incorporated it, I've put tests on it, um, and basically brought it in as utility. Um, you know, what we are trying to achieve here is just a consistent and uh, appropriate place for color fun functions to exist. And in the future, when new pro pro programmers need new functionality, they'll come to this location in the color mo module and grow it from here. 
Okay, now the last thing is signals. This is something that I discovered more recently. Um, when I was going through the fill and stroke, the dialogue, and I was going through the um, several other widgets in Inkscape, they were all using the same pattern for deciding whether colors had changed or not. And they were all just like passing the signal over. Colors changed, colors updated, colors dr being, being dragged around. Uh, basically, it's an intermediary. None of it was tested, of course. And all of it was baked into every single layer. So if you had like five layers of widgets or like or objects and various other bits and bobs, every single one of them would Im implement the same pattern. Um, and, and I don't mean implement as a sort of like in inherit from a pattern. Of, no, no, no. They were literally doing the same things over and over and over again. So uh, the idea behind managing signals is we inherit from the color object to say, hey, there's a selected color object, which is a color object plus some signaling. You can bind to uh, this color has changed. You can bind to this color is being dragged around. Um, and it implements that same interface that was replicated several times before. But now we have a non-widget based uh, standardized and fully tested signaling system um, that should allow any part of Inkscape to say, hey, uh, is has this color changed? Right. Usually it's like, say, if you've got five objects selected, uh, you'll be able to um, say um, if the color change chain, chain changes, then, you know, I need to do something to those five objects. This is probably where I would modify it for some of the ideas to do with uh, multiple selections. Some people have suggested if I select three objects in HSL, I should be able to change the hue for all of them by the same degrees without flattening all the colors to the same color. I agree. Okay, so conclusions. Um, the whole the, the, this work has taken me months to, to do, and I and I have thought very deeply and done a lot of research into both how it's been implemented in Inkscape, how it's been done in other pro programs, uh, and what is the actual problems we're trying to solve here. Um, I'm hoping that uh, other programmers will see this presentation and they'll be able to say, okay, we understand better what it is that you're trying to do, and hopefully they'll be able to. Um, guide me into making the code better in a in a constructive way. Um, the one thing to bear in mind, though, is that uh, this is very very late in terms of the programming to change some of the underlying functionality. So if we wanted to completely redesign how uh, the color API works and turn it on to functions, th that may have been possible to do in November, but I don't think it's possible to do now. I think there are some architectural decisions that I have made that are just going to have to be accepted or we're just going to have to make some kind of arrangement for how we accept this into the code base. But I'm happy to change the code uh, in terms of like memory management or specific objects or, you know, maybe there's some ways that we can redesign it as long as it doesn't require uh, vast amounts of testing to change. The reason for this is because um, the branch that you're looking at here is just one half. The other half is the application of this into Inkscape itself. And that is also a big branch. And if I change the API further, um, it'll cascade into a massive amount of work in changing all of the refactoring code that's already that happens in that other branch. Okay, uh, thank you for letting me practice this uh, presentation. I, if you have made it this far, I mean, good on you. Like, this was a long presentation, 30 minutes according to uh, Audacity. In fact, it was so long that uh, my camera decided that I, I didn't need to record anymore. I was kind of done. The maximum length of video was reached. So, um, yeah, I will hopefully see you all next week, uh, hopefully with a normal, more normal video about... Uh, you know, programming that I've been actually get, getting up to. And uh, yeah, thank you. Th thank you for watching.